and I'll prepare the other one as well. There we go. 100% prepared for this. All right. And this one's going to be All right. I'll just move on to the next one. Um Yeah, Door Kickers 2 uh is the current game we're working on. It's uh, basically the sequel for Door Kickers 1. Uh, and we tried to make everything bigger and better, switched it to uh, 3D engine, um, and the setting changed uh, a little bit from a, you're not controlling a SWAT team, you're control controlling uh, military troops. Um, this one, it's it's the most ambitious thing we've done so far, and that's why we've actually expanded for this uh, game and worked with more uh, outsourced artists for that. Um, what engine is this? Uh, yeah, that's uh, it's our own engine. It's basically, we have three games and three engines. Never do that. That's one of my first. If I would give you one advice uh, in indie, don't don't do that. Don't. If you have resources available to you that do the job, use them. That being said, um, the reason why we did go with our own engine is you have, for one, you have more control over the uh, what the engine does basically. So there's no uh, overhead of things running in the background that you, you're not really using. Um, so you could basically optimize for specifically for what you need. The other reason why we did it is because programmers like to do their own engines uh, and, uh, you know, hard to say no to our co-founder. So, uh, uh, but I get it. It's a, uh, you know, in an indie studio, you kind of want everyone to uh, like what they're doing. It, it's if one person isn't feeling good about what they're working on, it's gonna impact the game heavily. Unlike a AAA studio where you've got like hundreds of people, and if one person isn't really feeling it, you're not really gonna see that much of an impact. But yeah, we. It's it's basically the engine from Door Kickers One turned into 3D uh, during uh, about two years worth of development, which was promised to be three months by uh, our programmers, but they lied. Um, so yeah, uh, and the second one, yeah, it's a, also a different engine entirely, as it was uh, developed with uh, uh, co-developed with a friend of ours who's his own company, basically, um, Pixel Shard. So he developed the engine for Action Squad and uh, made most of the game. Uh, and it was a completely different setting, completely different like sort of game. Uh, and he came to us with the idea that he, uh, basically with a problem that he didn't think the game was going to sell anything because it was generic. So he asked us what he could do. So we jumped in at, from a game design point of view, and then slowly mo more of the team joined in the development of that game to add you know, assets, levels, stuff like that, to and this bring it to the level that we wanted it in the end. Um, I got to admit that the engine for Door Kickers 2 is still being worked on, so we we'll keep adding stuff as we speak. Uh, even though we should be relatively close to launch. Uh, well, there's a video here, so if you want to run the <laughs> video on your side as well. Uh, oh, great. This is, I can't click anything. Uh, I have one question. Yeah. Uh, so uh, if you use uh, your own in-house engine, then how do artists manage to do their job? Like, you... <laughs> You constantly change engines, isn't it a bit frustrating? Uh, it is, yes. Um, 
the, what I can say about that is you learn to use it and you learn to live with it and live with the constraints. Um, I, you know, it's always good to find something fun in whatever you're doing, even if it's uh, annoying as hell. Um, so I would say for me, at least, uh, working with the limitations, I try to make it fun in the sense that, you know, finding out how to do assets with a weird exporter that doesn't accept this mirroring and stuff like that, that is a bit of a challenge. So I look at it as a game within a game, right? Um, it's, it, yeah, it's frustrating and, but depending on how well the engine is designed and how, how much the programmers actually listen to the artists, it can work. I mean, we've, we've improved on the engine and, uh, the functionality for, uh, myself, uh, and the level designer as well so that we can do our jobs properly. Um, but, uh, you know, sometimes still things arise and I have to, you know, talk to Mihai and tell programmer and he tell him, all right, well, I need um, this, I need a particle system that uh, has, I don't know, Z movement. I don't have that in the game. So I need to wait like a week for him to implement it. And then I can actually do that thing that I was doing. Uh, yeah, it's a, uh, it's it's definitely easier as an artist. So yeah, from for an artist, it's always better to use a pre-built engine. And even uh, when I say that, I mean even in-house engines from big studios as well. I have had a lot of complaints from artists at Ubisoft and stuff when they're saying basically the same things, but at a macro level, you know, oh, the, the engine, oh, our version of the engine isn't the same as the one in France. So they've done something and we can't do it. It's, a lot of these kinds of issues happen when there's no like unified base for uh, the game engine. Um, but, you know, it's a, it's an adventure. What can I say? Oh, move on. All oh, right, yeah, we uh, we uh, don't know when this game is gonna come out. Uh, this year, hopefully. We said last year, but this year is definitely gonna happen. Uh, right. Uh, I'm not gonna uh, talk a lot about this. This is a uh, uh, basically a stat, a graph that I got from um, uh, RGDA, the Romanian Game Development Association. Um, I just to give you an idea of what the situation is over here, because obviously I know that uh, Bulgaria and all of the Eastern Bloc countries are kind of in the sort of same situation where people don't realize that, hey, there's a there's an actually good gaming industry in this in these parts. Um, it's true. Yeah. It's not. <laughs> you should check Poland. Oh yeah. Well, it, okay. We're not talking about Poland. Uh, they're they're a completely different situation over there. Um, but we'll get there. We'll get there. We keep talking for the past six years. We've been talking about oh, when, when are we going to make the next, uh, the, 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 um, Witcher of Romania. It's a lofty goal, but, uh, you know, if we, you know, we band together and we do more of these things, we'll probably get there in the end. Uh, but just to give you an idea, it's uh, the industry in uh, Romania is pretty big. Uh, it's it's doing all right for itself. Uh, probably one of the biggest uh, uh, sources of income for the country. Um, we got uh, the biggest studios, obviously Ubisoft, EA. Uh, Game Loft, um, you, I would put Amber Studio in there as well in terms of numbers, and they've been hiring like crazy. Personally, I'm not entirely sure what they're working on. They're very tight-lipped about that stuff, but I mean, you, you guys know about Ubisoft and w what they're doing and things like that. Uh, among those, there's, uh, well, besides those, there's a whole bunch of uh, indie studios. Uh, 
not a lot of uh, those have uh, so far published something. Um, they are, as, as far as I know, working on it. Uh, but, you know, it's a, it's a struggle, as I'm sure you, you're all probably aware. Um, the point I, have, I, I would make with that is um, do release something. If you do go on to make your own games in the game studio or join in the game studio, the point is to release a product. It doesn't need to be a great product. It just needs to be a, a project that is finished. One of the main things that company indies over here struggle is that very fact. Uh, I've seen a lot of people working on things for years on end, passion projects that don't go anywhere. Um, but that being said, I'm not trying to be gloomy about it. Just presenting the, the facts. Um, there are still uh, companies that do really well in the indie sector, uh, as well as the AAA. Um, and some of them are here. I don't know if you guys know any of these. Uh, maybe you know some of uh, Yaga, I'm sure was a big hit with uh, for a while, was well marketed. Um, Unbound just released on uh, uh, on PlayStation and Xbox, as far as I know. Um, and uh, Near Mage was just, uh, was not just, like a few months ago was fully funded on Kickstarter. Um, but yeah, there's a bunch of uh, indies uh, that are doing okay. So what I'm trying to say basically is you don't necessarily have to go with a big corporation to make it in the, in Eastern Europe or move to a different country to join a, an indie studio in the US or something like that. You can do it here and you can actually do it cheaper. So <laughs> highly recommend being in an indie in, the, in Eastern Europe. Um, right, well, let's see. And that being said, how do you get to you know, being uh, an <laughs> indie or a, 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 a developer. Um, first off, I, I would say uh, you, you need to uh, know what you're doing uh, and not just think that you know you're, what you're doing. Make sure, uh, you know, have people confirm that you know what you're doing and not your friends, uh, you know, go, to, uh, well, most of you are doing this right now, joining Arc Academy, uh, great idea. I didn't have that option uh, when I was studying, so that's cool. Um, going to a university or uh, an academy or doing courses uh, that will teach you specifically how to be a, a game artist or a digital artist, some skills do, uh, you know, across uh, different, uh, uh, what do you call them? Like domains of work. Um, but you have to have a, a clear set of skills to get your foot in the door, basically. Um, next thing, and I'm sure all of your, like, Everyone have said, has said this. Uh, I know all of our teachers at university have uh, have have said this to us. Go everywhere on all the all platforms, all social media, everything. Uh, nobody's gonna show up to your door and give you a job. You need to try and get out there, uh, get to know people. Networking sounds like I don't know. I, I'm I'm not a fan of the word, but you have to make friends to to basically get a, a further ahead in the industry for indies especially for AAAs it helps uh tremendously to know people because you know it's you have to you have to understand that people will sometimes you know you go to through an HR department they will uh see your CV and they'll hire you but uh, someone who knows that you who knows you personally and can vouch for your character uh, will always uh, 
you know, help out more than just blind calling people. Um, then, yeah, you need to get your foot in, uh, in the door. And that could mean internships or junior positions. Um, but also keep in mind, because uh, this is a, something that I've seen a lot of people uh, do, and it's a big mistake. Don't accept anything just to get in that company. Uh, don't uh, in, inter, unpaid internships is aren't a thing that should exist. So they've started to go away, but uh, you know every hour you put in is work. And uh, most students are afraid of this concept. Uh, I know I've talked to a lot of uh, to a lot of students who have said that, oh, but I can't find uh, I, I can't get in if you know I, I don't do this internship. Nobody's gonna pay me. I need experience because yeah, all of the companies ask for experience, obviously. But uh, you shouldn't uh, you should know your worth and uh, not let your desire to go to find the job uh, overpower your, uh, your your common sense. Um, because in the end, you will uh, get that call. You will uh, get the job. You just have to keep going. If you know you you don't find what uh, something immediately, just keep trying. Keep going back and forth until it works out and it will work out eventually there's a huge demand for talent um and there's uh i mean i'm, I'm sure a lot of you have also followed the news in uh this what's been going on with uh, blizzard and activision and stuff like that you all know that there's a huge attrition in the industry people leaving because they're not uh happy with their situation so there is there is always going to be a demand just know what you you are worth, what your experience. Don't ask for too much. Don't ask for too little. But just know exactly where you are placed, so you can strive for better, uh, but not underestimate yourselves. Um, just to uh, give an example of this whole like line of uh, this whole process, uh, I studied at uh, Staffordshire University in the UK because like I said, there was no uh, ARC Academy uh, or at least I, I, I think there wasn't, I wasn't aware of any uh, anything like that in, in this area when I went to study. Uh, I studied game concept design and it was basically uh, 2D, 3D uh, art for games and a bit of uh, art for uh, movies as well. We had a little bit of a segue into that um and then uh once i finished i uh didn't want to uh stay in the uk i know a lot of people think that is insane i that's the first thing that i get asked why did you return to romania um it's i it's a personal it's a pr personal preference i would say uh i liked it there but you know it wasn't what i've wanted so uh faced with that problem i needed to find a job immediately because i had to leave the country in two two months otherwise i would have to find a job in the uk so what i did was shoot my shots i went on linkedin instagram twitter everything posted all of my art did all of that the thing that helped me the most was going on facebook groups in romania so i joined romanian game development groups on facebook and I just literally, I just posted, hi, I'm a, a freshly graduated student. I need a job and just waited. And I got a lot of messages from people. Uh, some ghosted me, even though they, they wrote back. So that, that was weird. Some people do that. It's weird. Uh, and others, you know, uh, led to a few commissions and a bit of work. One of those works was Guild House Games. They offered me a test. They paid for it, which was very unexpected and a happy 
situation. Like I said, I was also one of the students that was thinking, yeah, I'm going to need to work for free as an intern for a few years to get a job. Turns out you don't have to. Uh, but, uh, you know, I did. I went into talks with them. Uh, they weren't uh, ready yet to give me, to offer me a full-time position. I had to return to the country. I, in the meantime, found an internship at a TV channel doing VFX for them. And then three months later, when my internship, it was also paid, uh, was over with them, I joined uh, Kill House Games when I got the call. Literally, they called me the day my internship was over. I was like, do you want to come here full time? Yes, I do. Thank you. Um, so yeah, it, it works. You just have to keep at it. When you, if you feel like you're just banging your head against a wall, expecting different results, it's, sometimes you will get a different result. Um, but yeah, uh, I've never actually had any uh, experience in a corporation, any personal experience. So, because I jumped straight to the indie world but I uh, have friends and uh, I've talked to people who have uh, who work or have worked for companies, including uh, the people currently working for me. You'll find that most indie studios are formed of X something people, um, which is a good thing. You do need experience uh, if you're going to uh, be an indie studio. You can definitely start uh, fresh with just everyone, zero experience, but a lot of gumption and knowledge. You can definitely definitely do that. Uh, but in that case, I would say what I said before, uh, it's even more important than to release your first project. Make sure that you've gone through the process of developing a game in, in its entirety and released it. And then you can do something better if the first one didn't work out or wasn't exactly what you wanted it. But if you keep postponing it, you're you're not a game indie studio unless you publish something, basically, is what I'm saying. Um but yeah there's a there's a there's a difference between uh indies versus uh and triple A's and uh I'm not sure a lot of people are aware of all of the those differences. Um I'm going to go into um, indies first because that's what I know better. Um, basically, one uh, some of the the best things uh, you have as an, uh, a developer for an indie studio is one, your uh, you have an increased ownership of your work. Basically, what that means is what you put in has is a larger part of the whole project than it would be in a AAA you make decisions on your work and that is uh fulfilling for most people it's it's good to have a voice basically is what i'm saying and in an in the indie studio because there's not a lot of people uh well it depends i guess on how big of an indie studio it is but in most cases uh every person in the team has a voice and they own their own work uh they have control over it and they don't have to just do what they're told um which you know it's something you might want or might not want uh a, another good thing uh but could be a bad thing as well depending on what you're looking for is that uh versatile skill set is preferred to a, a rather than a specific skill set um that is a good thing because one you'll never get bored you don't you're not going to be drawing roofs for uh, gta for a whole year of your life you're going to do different things but at the same time that means that you can't really specialize on one thing you can't just say that oh i'm just an animator that's all i'm going to do there's five people two artists if one of them is just an animator, then the whole project's going to slow down tremendously. Um, so yeah, you might have to learn uh, things that you haven't uh, planned on learning.
personally, I, I uh, appreciate when I have asked for, uh, when I have uh, looked for artists to work with for our projects, uh, I appreciate versati versatility um, rather than a specific skill set. Because, you know, that person will say, uh, you know, if we run into a problem and I need something that's not part of their core skill set, they won't say, no, I, I can't do that. They'll say, let me think about it and I'll get back to you and see if I can learn to do it. That's always been my mindset, um, which is, I guess, why f personally I fit better in an indie studio than I would do probably in a corporation. Um Generally, well, I'm sorry. Uh, can I ask you something? Sure, sure. <clears throat> uh, so the most important question, do you drink beer with your colleagues? Oh, yeah. I mean, we have we haven't done that uh, a lot since, you know, COVID started. But yeah, we drank at the office because, uh, you know, we don't have an HR department. So <laughs> who's going to stop us? Um, but yeah, we, we go out for beers, we go to like birthday parties and stuff. I mean, I've been to two of their children's baptized christening, bapt baptisms, whatever. Yeah. Uh, it's, you know, that's the thing. Indie studios tend to be small friend groups, basically. Uh, now, okay, if it's like a 40 people, 40 person indie studio, then that may be a bit of a different discussion, but you're still going to have friends in that company. It, indies don't really work if you don't get along with your team, basically. Yeah, that's good to know. Like the atmosphere m might be much better than the big studios. Yeah, I mean, it's, uh, it's definitely tighter knit. We're closer, but um, I mean, tighter, uh, big, big studios also have that, but not like the whole studio. You would probably go out with your colleagues unless you don't like them, which is also something that I've heard. Um, but, you know, it's, it, I guess it depends on what kind of group you fall into uh, when you get there. Um, but yeah, it's more, it's uh, more fluid and more friendly, which is also why, you know, you have generally more flexible work hours and stuff like that. Uh, you know, there's not, nobody's going to like shout at you for being 10 minutes late to work or something like that. Uh, we generally, especially since we've been working remote, uh, we set our own timeline. It, ideally, you want to be on a kind, of, kind of on the same work schedule with everyone because if you want to talk to them, kind of hard to do if it's 4 a.m. and you're the only one working. But, you know, it's, it's still, it's more flexible. Uh, but that there's a caveat to that. Uh, sometimes you will be required to work weird hours or overtime because being uh, a, an indie studio, the, its project is more, it's more close to you, it's more personal. Uh, the success of the game is directly tied to how well you, you do and the amount, the how much you earn is going to be directly tied to how well the game does. So and you, there's not going to be, or ideally, there's not going to be a, a, a boss saying, hey, uh, you know, I need you to work three extra hours today. You're going to want to work three extra hours if, you know, there's something urgent. Now, I know all the discussions that are going on in the world about, in the industry uh, about, you know, uh, treatment of, uh, um, developers and stuff like that. I'm not in any way recommending people to overwork themselves. In no way you should do that. What you should do is uh, take care of yourself. But as an indie developer, you will find this, that it's, uh, you will want the project to succeed and you will put a bit more love and maybe some time. That could mean that, you know, if there's an update coming up and there's an urgent thing that, I don't know, half of the models in the game are broken for some reason. Um, and I'm on vacation. But the thing is, uh, the, the update's going out, up on in two days. I'm going to want to help out. I don't care if I'm on vacation. I don't want the update going bad because that's my project. I, I, I'm not going to let it die just because, oh, I'm in on the beach somewhere 
fuck it, I'm going to go to McDonald's, find a network or something and then do the work. Uh, but that's that's the, the thing. You you are more vested in the success of the project as an indie, so you might want to work odd hours, which is different from having to work odd hours, which is something that sometimes happens in corporations. If, if that makes you happy, then yeah, why not work? Yes, exactly. Um, yeah, well, I've already covered the uh, like more you you're more close to the team uh you're more more friendly that also means that you will probably uh get angry with them easier e more easily you'll we have had fights uh because you know a small team uh there's egos involved there's everyone has an idea an opinion and you're since you're not trying to you know step step around subjects and stuff like that we just say what we feel and yeah, that sometimes leads to arguments, but you know, in the end, we all make up and uh, are friends again by the end of the day, hopefully. Um, uh, in terms of wages, it's general. In the majority of cases, it's going to be uh, probably less than you would find in a uh, in a corporation, uh, just because of the the you know. Indies are that they're working from not hand to mouth, but basically they're self-funded. They don't have a big daddy war box with a huge bank account behind them funding everything. They're you know running as uh, as uh, as well as they can be as efficiently as possible. So uh, yeah, wages will probably be lower. Uh, not super low, but lower than a corporation for, at a starting position. But that could can change depending on how uh, big the team, e team is and how well the game does. There's a higher potential for success and income growth, seeing as, for example, it's a five-man team and the game does tremendously. Obviously, everyone's going to get a slice of that pie. I mean, look at Valheim. Five, five people. Game sold millions i mean those people get ferraris um but you know i mean all of these things keep in mind there's always a compromise right um and triple a's like i said the in corporations you will get a a, a better starting salary probably um depending on well i guess what company it is and how well you negotiate that's another thing always negotiate know your worth negotiate don't undersell yourself and but don't also oversell yourself nobody likes someone that goes in saying that i'm the fucking best you should hire me a bit of humility bit of modesty that always that's always good um but yeah, so starting salaries are going to be higher at corporations. Um, uh, there's uh, the growth and career paths are uh, uh, more uh, com complex. There, there's more um, more ways you can go um, than the, than you would at an indie. There's so many titles. I don't understand half of the titles that you know uh, come with jobs or roles in the corporation, but that just means that there's room to grow. There's not going to be, oh, this is your job, and that's going to be it for the rest of the team. I mean, honestly, I'm an art director just because I decided to put that on my, uh, my business card. I mean, I was the only artist, and they said, hey, do you want to be called an artist? And I was like, fuck, yeah, I, I will do that. So in terms of career path and growth and roles, and if you like titles and stuff, uh, corporations are great for that. Uh, it's, they also come with job security uh, in most cases. I know there's a bit of a weird like mixed bag there as well, but in most cases you get job security because your whole, your job isn't solely reliant on this one project succeeding. In indie comp in indie studios, yes. Uh, if you work on a game for three years and that's your main, your hail mary, if that fails, more often than not, that indie studio will disband. 
it's the sad fact of life, but you know, that's that's what happens. May I ask a question? Yes. Most of the difficulties that indie studios have is actually staying together and getting a uh, finished product. What can you suggest about that? About mm. teams actually sticking with one another and going to the end goal? Yeah. Um, well, uh, I mean, I, I don't know a recipe for success in that regard, but it's it's ba what I would say is uh, kind of basically what I said before in, in a way, uh, always focus on uh, releasing. Uh, in most cases that I've seen this happen uh, where uh, teams disband before they release anything is because uh, they take too long uh the hype because everything starts with oh yeah we're gonna we're so excited about this project we're gonna do it it's gonna be awesome that hype dies down after a while and people start to see um see a lot of uh disappointment in the future they uh, instead of seeing the light at the end of the tunnel that they saw when they started the project they they just see all of the bad things that could happen oh we're taking too long um it's not gonna it's not gonna sell what's our, our what's our market uh it everything is, sounds complicated and at one point when it stops being fun um uh, people just move go their separate ways so i don't think there's something you can do specifically at that point when if you get to that point it's already kind of i'm sad to say but it's already kind of too late because they've already lost the battle in a way uh the what you have to do is from the get-go start with the proper mindset so you have to set the goal and keep everyone on track with that and the goal should be uh make a product and i say product because that's an that's something that uh a lot of indies don't uh don't really understand uh, a lot of them do passion projects which is great you should feel passionate about what you do but you're not you're at the end of the day you're trying to make up a, a thing and then sell me that thing you want to make money off, out of your project so you have to look at it that way you, you should keep your passion and feel good about what you're doing but also keep in mind that at at the end of the this project thing you need to make a product that sells and pays for all your work that you've done on it if it's just going to be an an awesome game that you love that's great but i hope you have another full-time job because that uh, i you know your your passion isn't solely gonna pay for your uh meals but yeah uh to back to your point to keep people in check they all need to be on the same page about what it is that they're doing uh it's good to have optimists but you need at least one realistic person on the team and you have to make sure that you know it, it, if that can be you great if that can be everyone amazing but you can't just uh go forward and with just hope so yeah it's 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 tough if you get to that point and teams break up because of that or if the game uh gets released but it fails um then you have to i don't know look back and try and figure out what went wrong and what you can do better and if you want to keep working with those people yes stefan yeah um i just uh, want to ask you uh about opinion for those studios which are like specific for a specific let's say art position let's say it's only for 3d it's like an outsourcing studio what do you think about those kind of studios it's like different than the indie studios it's like an outsourcing but still they're like uh like a different department but different yeah. studio of uh, another studio yeah, uh, I think I know what you mean. Uh, so, like an, a studio that basically hire, hires, say, say, artists, and they also they outsource the artists' work to like different companies and stuff like that. Is that what you mean? Well, yeah. Let's say uh, studio doesn't have uh, 
some specific artists and they just uh, hire a studio which do this let's say it's doing only 3d mm -hmm. modules or it's yeah. doing only animations uh, or, or whatsoever yeah I mean, yeah, those uh, those kinds of companies are great. Uh, I know there's uh, in Romania there's AMC, and uh, I think they're doing amazing. Uh, it's uh, it's a good it's a good path for an artist. Uh, the the only thing I would say is uh, keep in make sure it is what you're looking for, and what I mean by that is. These kinds of studios tend to have uh, certain types of, like specific agreements in their contracts. Some things that you might like, some things that you may not. Might not. I know that some studios like that uh, don't let you, you don't own anything. Well, obviously you don't own anything that you produce, but you can't even share that. Uh, which is, you know, I, I know a lot of, some artists don't care about that as much, some do. and. I mean, to some extent, yeah, your work is your portfolio. So it's kind of eh, if you can't share what you've worked on, basically. So I would say, uh, you know, they're great. Uh, and as far as I know, the 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 way the salaries are pretty good for those uh, types of studios, mainly because they work uh, like 98% of the time, they work with AAAs. So... That's also a really good, and it, 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 the good thing is, uh, you get to work on very different projects. Like today, maybe like this week, you're working on uh, Assassin's Creed or something. You're doing Vikings or whatever they're doing now, uh, and then tomorrow you're doing uh, sci-fi stuff, which is awesome. I mean, you have to find some versatility, some variation to your work, otherwise it gets boring fast. Um, but yeah, you know th those job those studios are great. One thing that you probably will find with those kinds of studios, indies don't really uh, work with them, mainly because they're expensive. Uh, uh, we, for example, we worked with uh, outsourced, but we I basically scouted uh, for individual freelance artists and worked with them uh, personally. That works better for us, but yeah, uh, that's uh, I. I didn't. I forgot about that. That's a the a good uh, other option. Um, working for a, an outsourcing studio like that. Um, what else haven't I, have I not talked about? Thank you. Oh, well, in, yeah, mm -hmm. it's nice to know that. Yeah. Uh, right. There's a. Uh, well, in corporations and in uh, studios like that, the outsourcing studios, uh, something that you won't find in indies, uh, in the, in small indie studios as well, uh, is that you uh, you can specialize. And by that, I mean uh, you can decide that all you want to do is concept art. And I've talked to artists, students who have said that. I think they said they didn't say I want to be a, a game developer or an artist for games, they said, I want to be a concept artist, and that's it. That's great. You can do that, uh, but you can only do that in, well, most of the time you can only do that in uh, corporations or outsourcing studios. Um, because, like I said, in, in small teams, you have to do more than one thing, right? So yeah, if you if you're looking to specialize, if you want to pursue one particular path, obviously go into uh, AAA and outsourcing studios, stuff like that. Um, that isn't to say that there aren't indies that look for specialized individuals. Uh, there are, uh, but they will either want to work with them uh, as a you know freelance sort of relationship occasionally. So that's not like a secure position i would say uh, or they will want to bring them into the team but that's a very specific type of situation if they need that like if they're expanding and their project requires something like for example if our game next year fingers crossed uh will require a heavy animation we have no animator uh we would probably look into bringing a specialized uh animator that can do that job. Uh, 
but that's like I said, that's a very specific situation. You have to find the the the, the right team. The project uh, has to be at the right stage that they would require your skill set if you're specialized in something. Um, and but uh, yeah, like I said, the the corporations uh, you can specialize, and the good thing is also that there's very different positions and roles you can fulfill. There's not, you know, artists. It's it's texture artists or a uh, hard surface modeler or, uh, you know, creature sculptor, rigger. And there's a whole bunch of things you can do, uh, which is great. You know, if, you, if you're looking for, you know, something that fits your skill set perfectly, it's easier to find that in a corporation, I would say. Yes, Todor. Yeah, hi. Um, I have a question. Doesn't that um, make joining in uh, indie studio much harder than joining a corporation? So let's say you uh, you haven't gone to university, you've been doodling with the programs on your own, but you're generally very good. You have a good portfolio. So you mm. uh, try to find uh, work in an indie studio, but the skills required there are, they need you to be more versatile. And mm -hmm. all you've done is, um, let's say, concept art, and you can't do anything in 3D. You can't do anything in um, environment art. And you uh, you basically apply for a job that you don't have the needed skill set. Whereas in uh, corporations, you you said yourself that there are more jobs and they're more spe specialized. So as a, as a start, as, as a start, if you haven't been in uh, the game industry at all, and it's your first time finding a job, doesn't that make the corporations uh, a better option? They are, yes, that's very correct. Uh, corporations are a better option to start with. Um, not only because of uh, what you said about you know uh, having more options and uh, uh, different roles that you can fill, they also have more internship programs and more onboarding than uh, Indies do. I mean, indies don't really do that at all because, it, you know, it's it's hard to find time to train someone new when you're every single person in the team is hard working on the uh, the game. Um, but yeah, it's uh, corporations are a good place to start, definitely, and they will. Uh, they you can. Uh, there's a higher chance of you finding work there. That being said, um, yes, okay. If you, for if, like, in your example, that if you're a concept artist and uh, oh, I mean, you've only done concept art and you won't try to find a job. Yeah, indies uh, rarely need concept art, uh, or it's a very, it's an afterthought. The hard, you know, the, most of the time they want to get into the actual development. And uh, it, you know, if it's if the game isn't super crazy out there and it doesn't need uh, concept as much, they, they're just going to move on to that. I'm, a lot of games do have the need for concept arts, uh, uh, but most of the time, it's always one of the original members who does that because they're some of they're the ones who had the idea. Uh, but because I don't. I want to get something across. You don't have to um, be demoralized by that idea that you know you've you haven't gone to a university. You you've only studied on your own time. Um, one thing that I uh, I personally and indies value more is the desire or willingness to learn. So. Um, for example, if I'm looking for something specific, like uh, we needed for Door Kickers 2, we needed a whole lot of environment assets, right? And uh, we didn't have time to work. I didn't have time to work on them. And my, um, and yeah, no, at the time I was the only artist. Uh, I wanted to find someone specialized in making fast environment art. And I found that. So I, I looked for a specialized person out and outsourced well created a freelance relationship with them but when we wanted to expand and bring in someone internally 
I didn't look for someone specialized. I looked for a beginner. Uh, and what I ended up, who I ended up hiring was uh, f actually a friend of mine who uh, never actually worked in game development in any way. She learned, um, she did uh, um, urban planning and in an architectural school. So she was familiar with uh, 3D modeling software, but she's never, she never used it in any capacity for game development. So but I knew, because I knew her, I knew that she had a willingness to learn and she would be open to feedback and she would basically get up to uh, the level that I need her to be faster than someone who is stuck in one particular niche that, and they just want to do that. So basically specialized or open-minded. And open-minded uh, wins for indies in terms of hiring internally and specialized wins for if you want to you know work with uh, an outsource sort of situation if that makes sense yeah yeah it does but uh, still you said yourself that uh, indies are always pressured by time and uh, trying to put something yeah. out there so that would be much much harder and it would still have to be a very specific situation like you said so yes. yeah in order to gain experience because from what i'm seeing i definitely prefer to work in an indie studio Mm -hmm. uh, I would have to uh, initially start in a corporation just to to get the uh, the feel of how the industry works and uh, the skill set needed for a, a job like that. Yeah, yeah, and it's it's definitely going to help you with that. It's like I said, it's it's a good idea to start with a corporation because yeah, yeah, it shows you how it works. You you can see the whole. Uh, uh, process of developing a game from within. Uh, you see how it is to work with different people. And uh, another like hidden bonus is you get to meet other people, other developers. So it's built in networking where you can uh, meet other people who will maybe eventually end up making their own indie studios and they'll know you from their time there. So yes, it's definitely a good place to start uh, as soon as a, you know, start uh, as a junior is to join um, a corporation first and then move on to Indies. Uh, yes, Bogdan. How do you guys manage your budget? <laughs> uh, we don't really. Um, we uh, basically the, the the only person that kind of like takes care of that is Mihai, who's also the main programmer. Um, it's uh, yeah, we're not really the best example when it comes to that. We we're terrible at, at organization and planning ahead. So uh, honestly, I couldn't tell you how how we, even we're still in business. I have no idea. It shouldn't be possible. We didn't plan for any of the costs for this game. It's already went about two, three years over the the planned uh, development time. So, man, fuck if I know. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I would yeah. say that's important, though. You're about to break the NDA. Oh yeah. Oh, if we had that. Uh, that's another thing that, you know, it, it takes a, someone has to write that contract. So nobody wants to do that. Um, but no, it's, it's important to do that. Uh, and, uh, you know, we, we've been lucky so far. I mean, I know I'm, I'm half joking. Mihai, I know he does some math in his head he, he, you know, bless him for doing that. Um, so far we've managed to stay afloat. What the, what I would say is, uh, and it kind of ties into what I said before about making a product and setting your mindset from the get-go to be, um, need, I need to release this thing. Um, think of what your value proposition is. So what that means is, uh, how much is this game gonna sell for? So for example, okay, I'm, I'm making, um, I wanna make a, 
twenty dollar game, right? Or you can do it the, the other way around. You could say, I'm gonna spend six months on this game. We're gonna be three people. Uh, we're gonna rent a, a studio for this. So just add that up in your head, and then divide it by what your expected sell uh, number would be to to basically uh, uh, level out your uh, investment in this. And then at the end, you'll get what the game should cost, right? So always think about, you know, what is um, this game going to, uh, what am I going to sell this game for? And is this going to pay back all the time and uh, and money invested in into this? Uh, so for example, if you're, if if you're spending four years on a game or something and you're selling it for uh and you're like five people right four years five people say, say you don't even work in a studio you work from your own places right uh you sell it for 15 dollars, and it's you know marketing didn't really go so well so maybe you do you sell fifty thousand units which is successful for an indie game right you haven't really made up all of your uh uh invested money and effort into it so always keep in mind what you're gonna uh what your the value of your product is gonna be and if you feel like you're going over time with this cut it off just end it release the product you can add something later or maybe do something better next time you're doing a project but there's no point in keep keeping at it and because in the end it's not gonna pay off um, so yeah, um, I actually have an example uh, of this. Uh, I have a, a, a few of my friends who I've actually worked with them part time for a, a project they're working on. It's a pixel art sci-fi game, and uh, they, like I said, passion project. They were super passionate about this. They quit their jobs, uh, and started working on it full time, and they've been working on it for six years now. So that's what I'm saying you have to avoid. There, you have to avoid falling uh, the pitfall of uh, adding more stuff because it's cool. And, you know, oh, it's going to be better if we do this and it's going to be you know, awesome. We just keep adding to it and adding to it and we're never releasing it. So, yeah, that's what I would say in terms of... Uh, uh, planning for uh, like financial planning i guess oh and uh, here's another thing actually because uh, that reminded me that's uh, this is one of the models uh, that uh, dan and mihai uh, went on with making this company and they say to everyone they meet uh, in the industry uh, if you can't make a, a project like a prototype that's fun uh, and works within six months change your idea do something else if you if you if uh, you can do a, a six month project and at the end of those six months it's a fun thing to play even though it looks like absolute dog shit. uh if the idea is fun it should uh be uh you should be able to see it in that prototypes vertical slice whatever you want to call it but if you should be able to do it in six months if it takes longer than six months to get that little snippet of game uh something's wrong with your idea that's a pretty cool advice actually <laughs> yeah um yeah i thought so too i i was pretty like oh okay well, when they told me the first time it makes it makes sense and door kickers won our first game they they did that basically they in six, the first they uh, got the prototype done in six months, and then they just added, uh, and it was fun enough, so they added a few uh, some UI elements, and then released in early access immediately after, just so that it looks like a game, and it wasn't just prototype programmer art. But I guess this is, uh, oh, I can switch to, yeah, I, I guess we're at the Q&A section right now. So uh, <laughs> we can we can keep going with this. If anyone else has uh, questions uh, and stuff, we can uh, talk. 
uh, the, the video playing on the background is uh, my first ever actually uh, actual fan art that I've done. And it was because uh, I finished God of War and I thought that game was amazing. And uh, I, uh, I basically made an animation in the style of our Action Squad game, uh, but with Kratos. Anyway, that's, that's about it. Yes, Stefan. Um, are the animation and the FX baited uh, with the same techniques or same tools? Uh, what do you mean for this, for this one? one? Yeah. This oh, one. yeah, yeah. It's a uh, it's basically uh, hand drawn animate. Well, hand yeah, hand drawn pixel art animation. Uh, I used Asaprite. If anyone knows that app, it's pretty good. It's uh, cheap. Uh, yes, Bogdan. Um, do you guys um, get any outside financing? No. No, we do not. Uh, we have talked to publishers in the past, um, and uh, we decided not to go with uh, with what you know with, with any of the options. Um, our publishers are good for initial, especially for initial uh, funding. Uh, if you don't have that, uh, luckily we had that because of Door Kickers one. So we didn't need initial funding, and everything else that we've discussed with publishers uh, didn't fit our needs. It, it wasn't a. Uh, we didn't feel like we were were getting enough out of that deal. So we decided to uh, publish everything on our own so far. Maybe in the future we'll find something, someone that you know works well with what we're planning. But so far we're fully funded uh, ourselves. I mean, initially the game was, the company was just Dan and Mihai and they funded it with whatever money they had left from their previous jobs. What capital you should roughly have to uh, to create a game as an indie studio? Ooh, uh, that's a that's a complicated question. It's because uh, it involves math, and I'm terrible at math. Uh, basically, like I said before, you you should the capital you need is is essentially uh, how many people are going to work for how long and any extra expenses and add all of that up and that's the capital you can make a game on your own uh and obviously you're going to need a lot less capital to do that um if if your game requires uh, a bigger team then a lot uh look at what the average salaries are and like minimum to maximum or the, like the average range uh, for each basically role that you would like or or whatever the average wages in your country of residence or where you're working and uh basically do a monthly calculation of how much that would be for all of the people working on the game and that's your capital there plus like i said whatever like extra third party licenses that you need and stuff like that you have to pay extra for um it's, you know, it, it's not uh, as much as people expect, but it's not, uh, it's not nothing. So if you want to pay your team uh, well uh, and you want everyone to feel happy and, you know, not go find another full-time job, you obviously need to be able to pay them a decent wage. Uh Right, we got Todor. Uh, considering the amount of work you got to do in an indie studio, do you have enough free time to play games? And what kind <laughs> of games do you like playing? Oh, hell yeah. I mean, I uh, if I couldn't play games anymore, I don't know what I would do. I mean, that's why I make games. Uh, but yeah, I, uh, I have a lot of time to play uh, and uh, uh, I get it also depends like what where we are with development sometimes I have like a shit ton of time to play and I just you know I I play a lot is what I was gonna say 
uh, without going into too much detail. But uh, what I play is varied. I like to uh, try a, a bit of everything that seems interesting to me, partly because I like games in general, but also because uh, it's good to l see what other people are doing and try to understand what they're doing bad and what they're doing well in that game and try to you know, apply it in your future projects and stuff like that. And by that, I don't mean steal stuff. I'm just, you know, give credit where credit is due and, you know, look at things objectively and analyze them and stuff like that, uh, which is what I like to do. Currently, for example, I'm... Uh, I'm really into Final Fantasy XIV because I uh, wanted to. I've heard that the story is amazing, so I started playing it. I'm almost close, almost at the Endwalker expansion that just released recently. I haven't gotten to it yet, but so far it's amazing. Um, Destiny, uh, I've been playing. Um, what else? Uh, Guild Wars, I'm gonna play this uh, this new expansion. Uh, I don't know. I uh, I haven't played a lot of competitives in a while, so but I used to play Dota, uh, Overwatch, stuff like that. Um, and I'm really looking forward to playing Elden Ring when I get back home uh, and um, Horizon uh, Forbidden West. Oh, there's a whole bunch of games that I uh, have to play. Oh, and VR stuff. I'm a big fan of VR. I know not everyone is sold on it, but I think it's it's got a, a lot of potential. Uh, okay, uh, Martin. Yeah, hello. Um, hello. So when you're working on an indie project, that's basically your child. It, it requires a lot of commitment. Yeah. And at, at best, you're going to be working on at least three roles. Do you find it hard to specialize and to choose one? If, for example, you want to have um, that side option to work in a studio, mm. like you have, you have to have a portfolio, and portfolios usually are specific. Are specific. And yeah. when you're working on an indie project, for the mo most of the time, you you're working like a lot of roles. So how do you manage with that? Yeah, that's a good question. Uh, and honestly, uh, yeah, I do find it hard. It's uh, and especially for the kind of game we're doing, um, it's. I don't have a basically. I'm. I, I sometimes struggle to think if I have to. If you ask me to put up a uh, put together a portfolio of what I've done in our game so far, I'll. It will take me a while to figure out what I can show, basically, because it's it's a mishmash of very different things, and uh, yeah, it is hard to do that. Um, I would say that, like, if you want to keep that option open, um, do stuff on your own time. I guess that's. That's kind of what I have been sort of doing, and that's it's not just to get a to have something of a portfolio if you know shit happens and I need to find a corporate job, uh, but also because you know I haven't you know I feel like I haven't drawn in a long time, so I wanted to uh, force myself to do that some more. So I've started doing like personal artwork and stuff, drawing our D and D characters and stuff just so I can get some practice in and some nice art for a potential portfolio, if needs be. Mm -hmm. Yeah, step <clears throat> away from the project uh, for a bit. Yeah, but I would also say that, uh, like I said, indies, for example, uh, appreciate a varied portfolio. Uh, so, for example, if, if I was hiring in, for, some, uh, for an internal position right now and I wanted a, a, a varied uh, skill set person, uh, I would prefer I would like to see a portfolio with like I don't know some 3D some maybe some uh, objects some characters maybe some drawings as well because that always shows that they know proportions well and stuff like that so I personally like to see how the person is thinking about what they're doing rather than just a series of finished works if that makes sense yeah it does thank you no problem. All right. Uh, Bogdan. 
Um, how do you guys choose what your next project is gonna be? Do you like, you know, gather at the bar and just talk about it? <laughs> or you have a, you know, like a plan ahead of one year ahead? Uh, well, honestly, we've, we've only done that once. Uh, after Door Kickers won, we had a sort of beer meeting. Uh, well, it was kind of like a bar, but also at the office. So we had a, a talk about um, <clears throat> what we want to do next. And then the game designer, he had a few projects already like cooking. So he told us about all of them. And uh, we kind of, yeah, we talked about the pros and cons for each one. Um, and in the end, you know, we, it was sort of a vote, but not, it wasn't, it, we all came to the same conclusion at the end. And we decided to, uh, for our next project to be Door Kickers 2, because we thought, you know, uh, wrong, we, 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 uh, we were wrong, but we thought at the time that uh, we can uh, make it fast building on the same engine and uh, and work off the hype from the first game at the time the plan was to release the uh, door kickers 2 uh within a year which would have made it uh 2016 and obviously that didn't uh, that didn't happen uh but uh, yeah that's how we decided we we thought you know this is going to be a good idea it's going to be fast we can uh use the the basis of what we've had uh we have already so it's not going to be uh, a huge undertaking and it was and basically action squad uh showed up out of nowhere when we were in a rut the uh, we didn't feel like we we felt bad basically we we weren't uh working on the game as well on door kickers too um and uh we met the Dan met with this friend of ours who uh, was making this other game, and we said, "Okay, we'll we'll put a pause on this game and uh, work on Action Squad for a while, and then come back to it later." Uh, so that's how we uh, we decided that it, it is a you know I guess you could say it's a sort of vote you know drinks and votes. Perfect. <laughs> All right. Then, yes, uh, Pavel. He's in the chat. Oh, oh, okay. Sorry. Uh, yeah, I see it now. Are there some projects that are more three D or not so pixelated? Uh, you mean uh, our games or? Uh, I'm trying to see overall more 3D. Uh, y y you mean uh, like in the so you you don't mean in our studio. You mean like in general, like in the industry or stuff stuff like that. Um, oh, okay, in which I had a role. Uh, yes, well, um, the wait, nope. So, the, the door kickers 2 is actually pretty, uh, it's 3D, uh, fully. It, uh, it's not super CGI because of the camera angle and zoom level, obviously, you don't need to have. Oh, shit. highly detailed uh, uh, like PBR graphics and stuff like that. Uh, uh, but that's about it in our studio. Uh, I have worked uh, as, uh, you know, commission. I've been commissioned to do some art for other games. Like I said, the, one of those, um, uh, there was a, a mobile game that's under development. Uh, and what else? Oh, I guess I mean it's not games, uh, but I've I've done a couple of couriers for for Dota too. Uh, 
and that's about it. They never got into the game, uh, but you know, they we put them up on the workshop. And that's about it, I think, uh, in terms of 3D stuff. Okay. Said uh, Yorand. I don't know if I said that right. <laughs> it's Yorand. Uh, yeah. um, so, what would you say that is the most dominant genre in the Romanian game development as as of this time? Oh, huh. Um... That's that's a good question. I don't really see a pattern. Uh, well, I guess I mean the only pattern would be two studios, which is us and another one that's also doing a sort of strategy game. But their their game is kind of like XCOM with zombies, so it's not really the same game. But you could kind of put it in the same broad genre uh, of strategy. Uh, other than that. Everyone's kind of doing their own thing in within indie studios. I mean, so mm. we've got like the point and click adventure, which is Gibbous and stuff. There's a sort of amnesia uh, like uh, studio. They've done Grey Dawn and they're working on another sort of horror game. Uh, there's platformers. There's a brawler like a, uh, what do you call it? The, the Super Smash Bros. Uh, mm. Yeah, there's not a lot of uh, overlap within our uh, studios, which is good, I guess. You know, we're not like, trying to. So there's a variety. Not yeah, yeah, yeah. There's path. Okay. Hundred percent. Yeah, there's definitely a variety there, uh, which is you know what what you would want. Uh, Boris. Yeah, uh, I wanted to ask for a personal opinion. What do you think about this uh, tendency and uh, the rise of life service games and the kind of mm. the cooperation, say, fall of uh, independent single player project? Uh, I I'm of two minds of it uh, with it uh, because on one side I I kind of like that sort of game, but to an extent. For example, uh, like I said, I play Destiny. I love Warframe um, and MMOs, which are also live service, uh, obviously. But I'm not their core player, I would say. I uh, I always like to play the new content and everything that's kind of interesting. And I do do some grinding, but up to up to the point where I get bored and I just stop. I don't do hardcore anything if it's just repetitive actions. Uh, doing the same thing. Uh, I think there's clearly a place for it, and I know that the companies see them as cash cows, basically, because you it's you make the product, you release it, and then you just keep feeding it small bits of content, which is cheaper to do than a whole new other project. Uh, with the whole, uh, you just add on to what you have instead of completely re uh, overhauling everything and then just building it from the ground up. So obviously, it's a lot cheaper to do live service models uh, and keep that player ba base invested uh, longer term. Uh, at the same time, it's, I think, harder to do uh, than, uh, than uh, like a single player game because it, the, the market is, at this point, kind of overly saturated with live service models. And... People are getting uh, they're getting quality stuff from some places, and so they, their uh, expectations rise. And basically, if you're building a life service model game, you're you're not really interested necessarily on uh, uh, what you know the same things that, that you would be if you're doing a single player. Like, okay, what's the story? How do I you know convey this whole thing in this? time span and then make the player feel good uh, uh, in these six hours of playtime that I have him for or something. You're thinking, how do I keep this guy coming back 
to my game, right? Uh, I mean, sure, maybe you have a story or something as well, but you're doing okay. Well, he needs to; these people need to come back, right? I need to keep my fans. I need to have uh, like a shop. I need to have uh, grindable things. There's obviously going to be RNG in any live service game, so I think it's there's a place for them. Uh, uh, obviously, it works. People like them. I think they've kind of bit off more than they can chew in most cases uh and uh they've slacked off they they uh i i feel like com some companies we all know who uh <laughs> yeah uh were pretty bad with their uh kind of practices when it with in life service model implementations I mean, and they still are yeah yeah i mean yeah they are <laughs> and the sad part is that most big companies are taking you know that is a strive like Yubi. Yeah, yeah, I know. It's uh it's not great seeing that. I I'm I'm never happy to see companies uh get shit on like that. Uh but you know, when they deserve it, it's you know, it's it's what you get, I guess. Uh I'm like I said, I'm also a consumer and I'm also a developer. So I understand when someone says, well, you know, it's hard to do this thing. I get it. But as a consumer, I know what I'm. I should expect from certain things. So maybe yeah. Sometimes I'm a bit of a devil's advocate, and I would give some companies leeway with some of their excuses that they're putting out. I would say, okay, yeah, that kind of makes sense. But in a lot of cases, no. There's there's no way you could. That, that that's an excuse. Yeah. Uh, no problem. But I would say that yeah, I, I prefer. Uh, I, I prefer a good single player game just because it's more, I feel more rewarded about my time invested in it. I, I get a good story or something. I feel good at the end of it. Uh, I didn't, don't feel cheated by the, you know, any shop thing or whatever. Yeah. Like, it's, uh, again, the battle of personal satisfaction against the community, you know, based it, experience. Exactly. Yeah. That's well said. I have another weird question, though. I don't know if you can answer it, even like sure. if you're allowed to answer it. Uh, how does your game designer uh, format his game design documents? Like, uh, what uh, software does he use mostly? Because I have tried to ask a few people, and every time I get a different answer, that's why oh. I'm interested. Uh, well, I mean, yeah, it's it's as far as i know uh it's like google docs and stuff like that i mean that's how he shares it with us that's a fourth different answer i swear to <laughs> fucking god well what can i mean i i think it's literally as you just need a word like formatting like a, a documents app it, it doesn't need to be super complicated uh yeah, I, mean, I understand. I don't mean uh, in that way. I just wanted to see if there was actually some standard, you know, thing that everybody uses. And every time I uh, try to establish a pattern, <laughs> it's just it doesn't exist. Yeah, no, I guess it's just preference at this point. God damn it. <laughs> well, it, yeah. Just embrace the chaos. Yes, yes, embrace the chaos. And my God. You know, it's chaos when it comes to documents and stuff. Not that I have a choice, but thanks anyway for the answer. <laughs> no worries. Uh, okay, Pavel, do you still have a question? Or uh, is that a new question? Or is it the previous one that was left up? guess not actually uh if you don't mind another question for me yeah no go ahead uh how does um, early access in steam you know change the way you look at the project in terms of development because uh we spoke to Hemimont a few days ago and you know the answer wasn't really straight up they said that it gives more freedom but they really didn't elaborate on why some developers may choose it over just normal development and release. Mm. Uh, well, uh, I, 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 some developers uh, choose it. Ba basically, there's uh, 
there can be a few reasons why you would go with the early access uh, version. Um, obviously, I mean, for us at least, uh, we chose it because uh, it's it's better to get your product, uh, your game out to as many people as possible as soon as possible so that you're not uh, doing stuff that your players will hate in a sense. And it also validates all your work so if you if you work for four years on a game and then you release it and then nobody else except maybe your friends or in a few maybe QA testers that you've paid, um, if nobody will uh, uh, will see it, then you might get to the end of that, those four years and and realize that well I I could have got done things differently if I would have known. So for us, we chose early access because it gets the game out faster to other people. They can test it, they can, see, and we can see how they play it and uh, see if there's anything we can improve. Um, we're also very close, uh, in close contact with our players. We have a Discord and stuff. So this this whole feedback thing works really well uh, for us, and it's why we do that. Uh, uh, in terms of freedom, I guess the idea with freedom is uh, that. It also kind of gives you an uh, an earlier cash influx if you're running dry on funds. It you know there's a boost there, but also you have to keep in mind that uh, those players that already bought it are not going to be there when you uh, release in gold. So take that into consideration. Some people sell early access cheaper. I've actually seen some developers sell early access more, uh, put a higher price on early access than the final release. Uh, because they had, they were using it specifically to test their game, and they only wanted early access players that were willing to uh, do that. So basically, if yeah. you really wanted to play the play the game, pay for it, uh, and then you will help us uh, develop it further. Yeah, many MMOs do that with the founders packs that let you play the game very early in beta, and then it releases in free to play. But the founders have some, you know bonuses yeah yeah but it's... yeah i get it okay so it's more of a you get a broader qa you know aud auditory and you get a better early fan base i guess yeah exactly and you know you, you know that you, what you're doing works and if it doesn't then you have time to change it rather than waiting up until the end to figure out that you're doing it wrong yeah okay thank you no worries uh, okay. Well, if uh, Todor, yeah, yeah. So, uh, just to ask sort of a weird question, something that you said about the pre-release of the mm -hmm. game and the uh, feedback that you do with the players, uh, how? Uh, important would you say it is in uh, developing the game or uh, releasing patches for the game or whatnot in a single player compared to a multiplayer game and when uh, do you know that the player base basically has no idea what the fuck they're talking about and they're if you go with their complaints and you change the oh. game in a way <laughs> that they want you know that the game is going to be complete shit yeah uh, afterwards and there are countless um names uh of games that have done that and i have played all of them and every time they have turned out to be complete shit, they keep getting worse with each uh, and every expansion so how uh, is it a hunch basically if, uh, from the um, game developer that says you know these people are complete shit despite that they are buying our game and i'm not gonna change that or do you always listen to them and you change it no no 100 percent, never do that <laughs> uh it's always yes it is uh, it's a balance that you need to find and it's partly a hunch uh, but also experience basically uh, and you have to most of the time I think uh, is you have to put yourself in those player shoes and try to figure out what they're actually saying because uh, you're a game developer you know how it works behind the scenes. They're a player. They know what they want to see. They don't know how to make it or what it 
what the consequences of adding that thing are. We've had, obviously we have a lot of feedback with people asking us to add things or change things in a certain way. And uh, we have to realize when, you know, maybe it's a good idea or it's uh, no way that's going to work. Uh, it's partly, like I said, partly a hunch, partly experience. Uh, don't ever really do exactly what a player wants unless it's exactly what you were going to do anyway. Uh, try and translate what their issue is, right? Uh I mean, we've had people saying that, well, we should add helicopters to the to door kickers. And like, I mean, it's com it would be a completely different game. I, I understand that he that person really loves helicopters and would think it's cool. I think it's helicopters are cool. They don't fit in the game. So at the end of the day, you just have to think, does this work with my core gameplay or does it detract from, from the core gameplay? I mean, look at... Yeah, like I said, look at AAA games who have just added shit to the game uh, just so that it's, you know, it makes it cooler or something. It detracted from the gameplay. The the core uh, of the game was lost and it was just, it's a, a, a mess of things just jumbled together, stuck together with duct tape, not really working in uh, unison. Does that answer the question? Yeah, yeah, perfectly. Thank <laughs> you very right. much. No worries. Uh, Boris? Yeah, uh, so for an indie game studio, what would you say is more important to appeal to as many people as possible with a game that is comprehensive enough for you know the most people you can get? Or is it more important to find the niche which will deeply appreciate the game even though it won't appeal to as many people? Uh, Definitely the second one. And I would say even for AAAs, you should do uh, the second one. Uh, but that being said, the niche doesn't have to be uh, a, a, a very small niche. It could be, you know, it could be broader, but definitely don't try to appeal to everyone. Obviously, everything that has ever tried to do that is just ends up being bland. It's a gray mess of everything you have to find what your what your niche is and what your game is trying to be and find the people and make the game for the people who would appreciate that sort of thing uh if you i don't know it for example if you're a triple a company and you want to make a competitive looter shooter right who's is it uh that's a very broad term. Is it going to be a hardcore game? Then, okay, focus on that. It's going to be hard. It's going to, you know, you lose half of your stuff when you die. I mean, that's already kind of a rule like, but, you know, you get the point. Uh, focus on what you're trying to design, what your game is, and don't try to please everyone because you never will. There, There's always going to be people who hate something that other people love. Get it. So snipe, don't spray, basically. Yeah, Exactly, yes. I mean, Door Kickers uh, did so well because we found a niche uh, that, you know, didn't really have any games uh, in that sec that sort of game style. And that's the only reason why it did so well. Uh, if we would have gone broad, I mean, you know, maybe added a, an FPS mod for all of the FPS player, that it would have been a shitty strategy game and a shitty fps game frame uh, first person game yeah so it would have been a worse of both worlds right well if uh if nobody else has any questions last call Cool. Well, I uh, I hope you all got something out of this, and uh, it was a uh, it was a pleasure meeting you all and talking to you. And uh, hey, you're, I mean, I'm hoping you're all the future of the industry. So you all better be good and decent people. Thank you. For... Thank you so much, Adrian. Thank you very much for the talk. Thank you. Thank you for your time. You are welcome.
We'll try to do my best to be the best person. <laughs> That's great. That's all you can hope for. <laughs> Thank you a lot and have a good night. Have a good night. Thanks and good night. Good night. All right. Um, uh, Krasimira, are you still here? Yeah, I'm here and say <laughs> goodbye. Good night. Have a nice weekend. All right. Well, have a nice weekend as well. And good night. Bye, Bye everyone. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.